I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone to Adventure Design Workshop, where you, by which we don't mean you, YouTube, get to decide what the adventure is. In this workshop, we're going to just sort of start off with a little something and just let people in the chat make decisions, just like in Fear Action Game Night, except for that it'll be probably a little bit different because we're just building one adventure together rather than sort of bad libsing and character. So we'll see what happens. And um, the Spartans and Rex the Liquid are talking about liking the intro. So that's an intro that General Twig from the RK Mark community just sort of built it for us. So thanks again, General Twig. It is super cool. Um, so yeah, we've done a few of these adventures. Actually, I've done two. Um, Linda, you've done even more. Yeah, I've done probably three or four at this point. They all sort of blend together after a certain point. That's right. So, I think the best way to, uh, to do it is talk a little bit about um, methodology of overall adventure design um, just at the beginning, not a whole episode, obviously. And then, once we've done that, we can take a little seed at the beginning and then start having all of us pitch in from um, Linda and myself, but also just ideas in chat, and we'll blend it together and come up with an adventure. So, uh, Linda, do you want to give some, yeah. some starting principles of adventure design? Well, um, first off, um, you want to, first off with an adventure, um, you'll know what level band you're designing for, and the level band you're designing for, whether low or middle or high, is going to impact a lot of the things that move forward. Not just the monsters you select, and the hazards and things in the DCs, but also the theming of the adventure, because... The challenges that are appropriate for a low-level character, you're going to be looking at a much smaller scope versus if you want to have a satisfying adventure for high-level PCs, you're going to have something that is world-shaking. Um, so that's something that you'll want to look at first. And beyond that, um, there's a lot of different starting points that you can go for. Um, you want to look for some kind of a hook. So a hook could be that you have a country and you've been reading through some information about that country, you found an interesting plot hook that you want to pick up on, and you want to run with that. It could be a particular um, and monster that you want to feature. It could be an NPC that you want to have. It could be a type of adventure that you want to do, that you want to do a, a dungeon crawl. It could be that you want to do an investigation or a mystery. But just some kind of piece to latch onto so that you can start building out from there and narrow down your scope. So there's types of adventures, there's people that appear in adventures, there's plots, there's also um, what, where do you want the PCs to be afterwards? So, or where do you want the world to be afterwards? So sometimes you might have an adventure that's motivated by, here's a location, it has monsters in it, I need that to be cleared out for something that I need to do later. Or I need to get this artifact into the hands of the PCs. What if the hook was an investigation about an actual hook, as in Little Warlord? An unfortunate pumpkin says adventures is an element of mystery or fun, and investigations are cool. So, yeah, let's do an investigation um, for our adventure. All right, it's Since an investigation. there are two people who are talking about investigations. Sounds good. So, um, we're starting out, we're going to do an investigation about a hook. Yes. So, there's going to be a hook, Yes. and that is the adventure hook. So, I think what, um, let's start off with this idea. So, there is a, um, sort of very aristocratic kingdom that has had trouble with pirates in the past. Mm -hmm. And some time ago, they defeated the pirate king. And they took her hook. And after they took her hook... They sort of put it on display to show that they defeated the pirates and put it under the most magical precautions. But then, the hook disappears one day. Dun, dun, dun. And that is, um, that is something that happens in the adventure. But now, um, we are going to build more backstory and other elements into this adventure 
the players might not know anything other than that hook about the hook. Yes. So, what level is this? What general level band is this uh, mysterious disappearance of the hook? Well, we can we might be able to figure that out based on what um, I guess what the people in the chat are going to say. I don't want I don't want to force it on them because. I mean, one time we had one that was sort of about, like, a political struggle that wound up, like, with weird, like, in a different plane things that looked like ghosts that were connected to a Lovecraftian horror. Fair enough. You're right. This isn't to being designed in the same way that you would design a normal adventure where you actually know what your level of your PCs are. So, we can let you guys surprise us. That's right. Fun arcane failure. Well, we... They still actually haven't approved that for our Twitch emoji for whatever reason, but we, we got to be close. Actually, I guess maybe theoretically they could have said that they disapproved them both, but I really don't think they would. Well, we'll check on that. Uh, yeah, we can check it out. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've got this hook, and um, we've got the, the Pirate King's hook. All right. And after her hook went missing... Uh, Nobody really knows, but we're going to have to know in the adventure. And we're so, going to have to know some of the, like, the local important people around who are right now. So, um, if anyone in chat has some ideas to add into it, uh, I'm sure we have some stuff that we can come up with. Which yeah. is, um, so, obviously there's got to be a character who's important in this who is, um, some kind of prominent pirate who wants to uh, who wants to show that they can be like the pirate king of old that everyone thinks stole it. So unfortunately, pumpkin suggested the son of the pirate king. It could so be, it could it be just, her son. Yeah. Uh, the son of the pirate king is prominent and it's probably going to be a red herring because it's too obvious. Yeah. Um, but probably these upstart pirates that. Maybe even, because uh, Rex looks at Upstar, so we can combine it. There's an Upstar group of pirates, and one of them claims to be the son of the Pirate King. However, nobody really knows, like, you know, Pirate King had men in every town and mm -hmm. women, and so nobody really knows what her son um, would look like and how many sons she has. And so this person claims to be the son of the Pirate King, and that's definitely who the kingdom has decided. Like, the inspectors are like, this is who it was. And um, are going to look after, uh, go going to go searching to find that son. Um, so someone who used to be her first mate is going to, it could be involved in this as well? Okay, so no, Craig says there's a bartender there's, in oh, the I kingdom see. who used to be her first mate. Um, who's another suspect, possibly an informant, or someone that you have to talk to. Um, Rex Lickalood is wondering, is the hook magical? So, um, that could be something where it seemed, may, maybe it seems to be magical, but, um, no one in the kingdom could get the magic to work anyway, and they weren't sure if maybe the pirate king was just, had magic and made it look like the hook was magical. Um, Dragoon Spirit wonders, is it cursed? Oh, well, it could be cursed if... The, someone maybe if someone who's not considered to be a worthy wielder of the hook maybe. picks it up and tries to wield it, then they suffer a horrible curse. Or maybe the pirate king's spirit is cursing the hook, or in some way is 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 affecting the hook in a certain way. Oh yeah, like it devours your head and replaces it with just it. Uh, potentially, yeah. Could be a possible one. Strayu says this could be a Dread Pirate Robert situation with a secret apprentice that has returned for his inheritance. So, um, they, these are these are a, like a really good list of dramatis personae that we can have sort of showing up in this situation. On we, it, we can really give. They, they seem like they'd all be interesting people to talk to in the mm -hmm. investigation. The Secret Apprentice, it sounds like, is a proposal for who is behind this. So then we have the idea where you have the, the oh, I'm the son of the great pirate king is coming in and being obvious. And the first mate is someone that you talk to somewhere along the way. But then this person who is eventually behind it is someone who was a protege of the pirate king that people don't know about at first. Hmm. That could work. Um, to riff off of that idea of, like, the secret uh, the secret reveal could be that the one behind the heist 
is the Pirate King. <laughs> uh, maybe the Pirate King actually intentionally cursed the hook. Uh, she knew that she was going to get caught and executed. So she cursed the hook to become an intelligent item. Intelligent items, as we know, um, can just not give their magic powers. So therefore, that's why no power seems to show up. And so, basically, just for maximum, um, for maximum knife twist on um, on the kingdom, just when someone was in the museum looking at the stuff, maybe like the princess uh, or prince, maybe a princess because the pirate king wants a wants a body that is more similar to hers. I uh, was just like in the museum looking at all of the different curios. The the intelligent item like takes control, and so. Um, in that case, to try to, like, I'm going to do the biggest heist I've ever done. I'm going to to steal from this kingdom that that that, um, that defeated me. I'm going to steal their heir, mm -hmm. and I'm still around. But also, maybe the Pirate King just kind of, she's pissed off at all of these people that we've talked about so far for either failing or even maybe the bartender betrayed her or cut out when it looked like she was going to lose. So maybe she definitely... Like plants a lot of evidence and other clues that might lead you to trying to go after all these other people, except oh, for her. Oh, and unfortunately, Pumpkin has a good suggestion for an ally, a member of the government who, while being well, upsetting now, used to be a pirate. Oh, uh, yeah. You may not initially want to reveal their sordid past, but when you start to investigate things, they could come to you as someone who could assist you in the investigation. That's right. Because they may know more about the... The dirty laundry of this pirate king. They may not know the pirate king's current plot, but they may know about how the pirate king thinks and about how she likes to go about things. That's they right. They may know what her what her vessel looks like, how she likes to disguise it when it's in port. So that might let you find out more information about her and her movements. Mm, no, that makes sense. And also, that could be something that the bartender, who used to be the first mate, could serve a similar role. Um, but. Also, they could serve a different role of being the Patsy, or maybe the one in the government is the Patsy, mm -hmm. because that's the one who betrayed her, and the, the and the bartender serves the role that you just said of, like... Because bartenders are often, like, have yeah. an insight of being the one with insight who tries to tell you more about the Pirate King. It's like, this is the real Pirate King. Everyone has these stories about her and what she did and what she was well, like. Well, that makes me think, then, that the upstanding member of the government that no one knows used to be a pirate is someone that the Pirate King goes after. So maybe, so if this turns into, then, that person goes missing or that person is murdered or something else. Like, oh, yeah. Why did this person go missing or murdered? And then it's that just could a possibly, random government that could be That could potentially be a clue when you figure it out. Like, oh, this person used to be part of this pirate's crew. There's even more weird stuff going on with this pirate's crew that we need to get to the bottom of. Mm-hmm. And Strayu says that the apprentice could turn out to be a secret ally investigating the matter. And um, is upset that someone stole the hook and looking to retrieve it. So it could wind up being someone who you think is an antagonist and you get into a skirmish with some of their... Um, minions earlier on but then you later realize that the both the pcs and the um and the apprentice are actually trying to figure this out and that the apprentice knows nothing about it so it's an interesting sort of sandboxy whodunit that allows um a large amount of interactions with so far a variety of different aspects of um of the area um we have we need some villains that have too many allies, says Unfortunate Pumpkin. So let's let's throw something else into the mix to give us some more um, some more opponents, which is so the pirate king who is now in control of the princess with the hook is has a lot of options because um, she can throw not only potentially pirate themed opponents like maybe her hook also allows her. To call forth the souls, like the ghosts of the pirates who died, um, defending her to the end, and so you've got some undead in there. But Mimi, because it, it's like it seems to be the princess, can probably get the government and the knights to actually turn on the investigators if they're getting too close, and be like, no, they are the ones who stole the hook, or at least that they make them seem to be criminals in some way. So you can wind up getting into a situation where everything flips. You've allied with the apprentice, mm -hmm. but then at that point, um, 
the government's like, ah, we found out you've allied with pirates. So, yes. like, your own employers actually turn on you uh, because of the fact that, and Possible Cabbage says ghost pirates always make everything better. Uh, ghost, ghost pirates, pirates or, or pirate, pirate ghosts? ghosts? Duppy. <laughs> <laughs> Duppy is just, like, the cutest little random name for, like, a terrifying, horrible, horrible incorporeal creature. I uh, know, right? It's not fitting at all. But, yeah, it could be some kind of ghost pirates. Uh, everyone likes to add ghost pirates in. So we've, we've well, got this, some ghost this pirates. This we've got some government officials in there. Because as a villain's plan unravels, they're willing to expend more and more resources and to become more and more obvious in order to stop you from uh, from getting close to them. So it could be, with, with a villain like this who is doing all this manipulation, I imagine that the Pirate King is going to start with the more subtle things. It's going to start with more slight trying to send opponents your way. Then things start to go south. And so the Pirate King is going to use their influence within the government by controlling the princess in order to stop you there. And then if you're still coming closer... Then she's like, okay, yeah, screw we need, this. We need something epic we, in that we part. Need, we need the big guns. And the big guns could be the ghost pirates. I could also see um, I could also see if you're going to be going out to sea for this fight, having right. sea monsters come up and attack you, because it's always fun to bring in more different types That's of right. creatures into an adventure. So let's do that. So she throws the ghost pirates out to cause enough chaos for this, because this is going to be a little bit obvious. This is when you're closing in too much. Grabs another thing from the museum, which is like the the figurehead that was from her ship that was her ship was burned to the ground, but they took the figurehead as a trophy. Like brings it out to the harbor and calls forth like a bone ship of the previous ship, crewed by the dead and some sea monsters, and then just like what appears to be the princess just goes on to the prow and sails off, and then the PCs have to have to do sort of an aquatic. Uh, chase possibly dealing with the sea monsters in the way find uh where the, the she probably has a big head start because nobody likes fighting incorporeal pirates mm -hmm. they may have to chase her down to like the old abandoned pirate island that has been scoured by the kingdom where where she where she was defeated or maybe she has a backup base that they never found because that wasn't where the last confrontation is that still has some of its traps and monsters but that the apprentice or the first mate bartender could actually tell you where it is. So even if you lost her, you might have a way to know where to go. Yeah, and that's important, too, to make sure that you don't have, like, oh, it's a chase, you fail the chase, you lose the adventure. And that's that would right. be a good way to get that information to the PC. And it's I possible that the chase might just not be available because the incorporeal creatures are too distracting. And so that just having that backup because that might be the primary plan and just or some groups don't like to do a chase um definitely helps and all the npcs you guys have thrown in give us a lot of, of a lot of pull because even if one or two or the and there's the government official even if a few of them have been killed by this point in the story based on the way that this sandbox investigation went there's going to be one of them left who would have that information and this sounds like a perfect opportunity too for I could see since you have these ghosts creating some kind of a lure or a trap along the way in the waters that, oh wait, that's their ship. It seems to be their ship off in the mist and things like that. And then if the PCs don't notice what's going on, which they can have a chance to notice it, then they may run aground onto some terrible reefs that are occupied by sea monsters. And Ula Warla points out another option is a portal to uh, to that island could, could show up. Just maybe a whirlpool in the water that just takes you there right away. That depends on if you want to add a little bit of sort of maritime um, exploration, um, a, sort of a beat of that after the ridiculous, um, the ridiculous raising of the bone ship. Or, or if you want to have it keep up in this higher, uh, this escalating as thing, really depends upon the, yeah. but depends upon the tempo and the length of your adventure where you want to have that that peak and then you say okay now we're exploring we're on the trail we're on the trail we're on the trail oh something else happened something else happened right. versus okay this is going toward our grand conclusion right now and i think that that depends too in part on whether you want the portal to lead directly to the grand confrontation because if you have the portal that feels like it's leading into the grand confrontation to me whereas the sea could possibly be leading into okay now we need to do this other thing to track and, it down. Uh, right 
And then now we have this island, and there's other encounters on the island, and then we made it to her base on the island, and now we're going to ramp up again to the next big, um, the next big crescendo. So it depends on, it really depends on pacing. It depends on the length that you want for this adventure. A treasure hunt where you have to follow a map? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe the first mate um, explains that the reason nobody ever found the Pirate King's true base is it was on... Uh, like a moving island that's actually like a giant sea turtle, mm -hmm. but that there's a magic treasure map that um, that only the captain and the first mate had a copy that sort of always leads to where the sea turtle is, and it just it changes the map, and so you have to hunt it down to find uh, where the X marks the spot to find where the turtle is right now. A treasure map could also be a really good treasure for the PCs to find in the Pirate Queen's base, maybe there, or Pirate King's base. Maybe there was a treasure that she knew about, but she was never able to claim because it was just too dangerous. So then that is, so the PCs think they're done with all this stuff, but then they have a treasure map that leads them to another dangerous location where they can find more things. I think that makes sense. And, um... Let's see. Strayer says there could be an underwater cave that they have to go through at some point. That's always that's always a good one. Then you could throw in sharks and other uh, other underwater creatures, potentially that, that live on the island. Maybe that's what the access is like, because the island, if well, now if we're if the island is a giant turtle, maybe the maybe it's really hard to climb the sides. But there's sort of like passageways within the shell that you can use, and that's sort of an unconventional underwater cave that you can use to go upward. Or maybe the, or maybe the turtle themselves is kind of up higher on a cliff somewhere, land and has landed, and then you have to. But in order to get through the cliffs, you have to go up through the underwater caves to reach the upper access point and reach the turtle. I feel like um, that. Probably the Pirate King's endgame, if she's definitely losing, is going to be to convince the PCs that, in fact, this is the princess who is just fed up with her parents and decided to take the hook and do all of these things because she's an excellent liar and not the Pirate King possessing with a hook so that they don't dispose of the hook appropriately and think that it's a different, similar plot. To the actual plot. Oh, wait a minute. We have another idea. What if the counterpoint zombie turtle island... The turtle the island is island also a zombie. ...and the base is inside. So you have a giant zombie turtle, moving zombie turtle, that is actually the base. And I wonder, maybe maybe the maybe the base used to be on a smaller base that was on top of the turtle's shell. But when the... But when, as the pirate queen died, or pirate queen died, and then sort of this corruption started to take hold... Then yeah, I didn't want to use turtle... Pirate Queen because that's Besmara's title. So. Yeah, uh, the Pirate Queen. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's why. That's why I keep thinking Besmara for yeah. this, and it keeps distracting me. But yeah, so then, so then the, so then this undead Pirate King is uh, is rebuilding the base and having a bigger base in the in the center of this moving turtle, because she's not inactive during this time. She's plotting. She's scheming, and in a way. Well, her original ship got burned down, but what's more badass than the inside of a zombie turtle? I see. So she's like leading the zombie turtle towards the capital. Yeah, the the zombie turtle is the is the flagship of the new fleet that she's building. That makes sense. And so she's got this this giant zombie turtle. It used to be a regular giant turtle. And uh, all-terrain zombie turtle. If the zombie turtle had, can turn over and then cause issues as the PCs are inside the, the very building around them, which is yeah. the inside of the I'm turtle. I'm going to imagine that, that if if she built her base on the zombie turtle, it probably doesn't usually turn upside down so, so yeah. that they all get crushed. But that could also be like a last move, kind of like yeah. a more reasonable and sensible version of the whole building comes crumbling down when you beat the um, the villain. Oh, or Willow Warlord, you might be able to find a way to flip over the zombie turtle to, to mess That's her true. up. That's so true. is the a... PCs might be able to do that, or maybe the, the pirate uh, king can do that near the end. If she can convince that the, the PCs that the princess is just going, um, is just doing this on her own, and flip over the turtle, mm -hmm. 
and make sure that, that while that happens, like the princess drops the hook. Um, it's possible that the PCs will um, might not look for the hook and it can go drift off and she can um, go do something else. Um, so flipping the turtle could be a like a good escape plan. Um, I was thinking about it, too, from the perspective of the idea that we talked about in Dynamic Encounters episode where you can have hazards that it's expected that the villain will activate, but if the PCs are particularly clever, they may be able to find a way to activate it to their own advantage. That's right. So that's what I was thinking of this zombie turtle as. That's a good point. And that would be a good time. Like, she's losing. So you flip the turtle, maybe have the hook scatter off, the princess go another way. And throw in some weak incorporeal minions that have already, like, this, like those pirate ghosts, there's a callback, that have already proved they can't beat the PCs. It's The PCs are even higher level now, mm -hmm. so it's an easy fight. Except, they're incorporeal, so it doesn't affect them that everything just turned upside down and are shaking around. They can just deal with it. They're incorporeal. So, they are not affected by the bad situation and are attacking the PCs while the PCs are trying to deal with this. Unfortunately, Pumpkin's talking about the turtle coming back to attack the city you started at. So I can see this in terms of, if you don't completely defeat the Pirate King here, then her next plot involve her next plot down the line, she's still mad at the city, she's still mad at the government, and she's even more upset because the PCs mess with her plots. So she decides that after that, she's going to ride the giant zombie turtle in once she's gathered her fleet and try to lay siege to the entire city. Or maybe even just because of the, the fact that the turtle is so large and you have to explore it for a while to find her base, maybe as you've been on the turtle doing that, it's actually been going back to the capital oh, the whole yeah. time. And uh, Ular Warlord talked about the uh, the turtle's mouth or shell could have cannons mounted in it. Yeah, totally. It's a zombie turtle. I it could see that. And it uses the shell sort of as an embankment. Um, so Malachi Constant is wondering what the heck is today's topic, which is build an adventure workshop. So um, yeah, we're building an adventure, and based on suggestions from based chat. on based on whatever suggestions chat sends in, and we're now on a zombie turtle island that is um, has cannons and is coming after the capital of a kingdom that defeated the pirate king and. Uh, took her hook for a museum, and then she kept her essence inside of the hook and possessed the princess who was at the museum and is now, has done a variety of very twisty and sneaky things that the PCs have sort of figured out and dealt with and have, have forced her to raise a bone ship to go back to her turtle island and, and chased her back to the island. And now we're talking about um, very goth Terry Pratchett. <laughs> I think that's a compliment, everyone else in chat, to you guys, because um, goth, goth Terry Pratchett sounds good to me. That's to me as well. <laughs> Alright, so, let's see. I feel like we actually have a, a large number of beats here for a very, a very interesting, um, a very interesting plot. And one where you can find surprising allies and foes at both times from both the pirates and kingdoms people so it allows the pcs also to have a lot of flexibility in which side they lean on more either way they're going to find some adversaries there or find that the, the script is flipped on them a little bit and they have to sw switch around like if they're very lawful and going with the kingdom they still get shade thrown on them during that one phase of the adventure so then we also so this then, feels this like it's about me, an AP volume worth. Yeah. Of of, of, of content, plot. and it also feels to me like it's mid level because you're going to be having these big climactic fights and things like that. But if people were super high level, then they would have other spells that they might be able to use to short circuit aspects of this plot. So I think that the PCs are are in the mid level range. Yeah. And then then we could use that to select what kind of monsters are going to be appropriate. That helps us this. with like the idea of incorporeal creatures make sense, and a lot of the things that we selected here make sense. Hospital Carrot says definitely. Cabot says definitely mid level because of the incorporeal. They have to fight incorporeal things, but they also have to be at the level where the government deciding that the PCs are outlaws for their actions isn't just something that the PCs say. Well, I don't care because I have the. I have the king of the neighboring kingdom on metaphorical speed dial because I saved the kingdom from something, something. Or like, we don't care because we can destroy your whole government. Yes, exactly. By ourselves. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha So, um, 
Yeah, I think that's right. He's probably mid-level. Probably starts out around level 6 so, or 7. I was going to say ends around level 8. And level ends nine. around level 8 or 9. Yep. Maybe 10 at the very end when you're doing the last things. Yeah. It just Eight depends on how long it is. the number that popped into my yes. head for this adventure. But yeah, I, that's in the middle of, the very middle of that range, no matter which of the numbers. Uh, but what I would probably do if I was coming up with this custom is I would then look at the, and I could pick it for any level, is I would look at what the monsters are that are already written. Because of course I can write my own monsters, but it's nice when you can call upon bestiaries and things like that. Um, and I may also look at, if I was writing this for for first edition, I'd also look at like what kind of class I would want the pirate queen to be and if there's any super abilities that you might get at a certain level. Um, and I'd also be looking at this from the perspective of encounter balance because it's generally good to have encounters where you have multiple creatures as opposed to just one. So if I'm in a position where a lot of times the things that I find um, that I want to use are just pushing the level range, um, and they would only be able to exist as a solo monster, then I might think, well, I probably want to make this a little higher level so that right. that would work out fine. That makes sense. Um, so we've, we've kind of figured out our level range. We've kind of figured out our scope. Uh, see, uh, we, we, we were going to do the level range at the beginning because we would honestly do that if we were building top-down yeah. at Paizo. But when you're doing a, a panel, we kind of had to build bottom-up because we wanted to incorporate everybody's ideas. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So, um... We started with the concept of hooks. We have a literal hook, but there's another type of hook here, and that is how are the PCs going to get involved in this adventure? What kinds of things might draw them into this situation? Like, yeah, who or what asked them to get involved or caused them to decide to get involved? Like, there could also be that this, this adventure is sandboxy enough. It could have multiple hooks, right? Mm -hmm. It could have a hook... Where, um, like Ular Warlord said, which is, wow, this this what this really powerful and or just awesome hook is missing. That might mean it's easier to get to than with all of the protections that were on the museum. So if the PCs are actually fans of the Pirate King, they might start off by wanting to see if they could get the hook. Um, and this ex pirate politician could certainly be involved in. They could be out their patron yes. uh, who wants to hire them to find who stole it because they're worried that it might be a big fan of the old Pirate King who knows about their treachery. Speaking of more hooks, there could be a bounty on the hook. Um, the PCs could be strong-armed by a noble to fetch it to get them off the hook for something. That's right. So you're That could actually work really well if all the PCs... You, you, you go around the horn and you say to everyone, All right. You know, you guys have the alignments that you do. You're not, you probably might not have them just be evil, but it's like, so, life is hard. Um, the rules of this kingdom are harsh. What, what law did you break? And then everyone goes around and says what it is. And then the noble, and then it's like, well, there's a noble who's going to get you all off the hook for all of these things. Mm -hmm. As long as you can help um, find this hook. And then that way, you're already criminals, so when um, the Pirate King tries to get the government to turn on you, mm -hmm. it's easy. Um. <laughs> so so just to, just to recap here, the adventure hook and the, the adventure hook and the story hook for how people get in, the adventure hook is a hook. And the story hook for how you get players invested in the story is to get them off the hook. Yes. Okay. That's right. <laughs> So, they want to get off the hook by finding the hook. And it's possibly, um, I think that maybe that noble who hires them is the, uh, the former pirate. Maybe the former, but it, it's probably someone who wants to, like, who's not just, like, for my own collection, but, like, seems to legitimately want to get back for the museum. Maybe they're, like, the Grand Vizier or some kind of title that's really sketchy in Arabic, <laughs> but it's actually... They're not a sketchy person, and they're just going to get killed by the Pirate King later uh, on in the plot. Pirate says that grave robbing a tomb could be against the law, so that could be what they did in the past. They were adventurers, and they decided to do their adventury thing and go to the dungeon and take stuff, and it was a tomb. And so they may even be all in trouble for that. Um, Strayer Stray wanted yeah, Stray Stray the theft yeah. in the first place. And that could be potentially, or even just suspected of the theft, where yeah. it's like, 
I have all of you criminals and one of you here. You're known to be one of the best thieves in the city and people think you did it. And like, well, it wasn't me. It's like, all right, we'll prove it. And the PCs could also have been hired by mercantile interest, Ray suggests. That's, that's possible, Because too. they're hired by mercantile interest and then, again, not officially the government, then that still makes it so the government could say, hey, you all are... And it, that if they're hired by an outside interest, there could also be the added complication that the PCs getting in trouble with the law also makes these mercantile interests look bad. So then the mercantile interests the, may come after the PCs in the future. They may have to work on how to placate those mercantile interests if they're trying to have a long-standing relationship with them. So maybe the mercantile interests regularly hire the PCs to do things. And now the PC's allies are in trouble because the PC's are being framed. Maybe the mercantile interests are third party. Whatever hook you decide, maybe you can decide which hook works best for your party. Maybe the mercantile interests are a third party that have been secretly trying to steal the hook for a while. And they've been slowly removing the magical protections on the hook for a while. Um, planning on stealing the hook. But then they didn't. they know they didn't steal the hook. Yeah. And so they hire the PCs to get back the hook. Um, and, but also then later on, people figure out that the PCs' patrons were doing this. Or um, the PCs figure out that their patrons were sketchy and it's like, why did they hire us then? Or even if they're not the PCs' patrons, if the PCs are working for the government, they figure out these weird merchants who are actually connected to the local Thieves' Guild and own the local Thieves' Guild have been having the local Thieves' Guild like, lower the protections on the hook. That looks super suspicious. Yeah. Maybe it was them. And Pumpkin has a point about if it's the former government official who hired them, and then the former government official showed right. up dead, then it looks like, oh, that you're really suspicious because you were working for this person, and this person hired you to help out with this, and then this person is dead. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I really like yeah. that person. Also... If they die and it's also revealed at that point their secret that they were that the government official secretly was a pirate for the who, who worked closely with the pirate king and they die. Yeah. And that's part of the the pirate king getting suspicion on the PCs. That makes the PCs look hella suspicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's like, well, your patron was a pirate who worked with the pirate king and now is dead. Who has the dog? Obviously, the PCs Obviously have it. Obviously, the PCs have it, yes. <laughs> uh, Stranger says the Black Spot could get involved, or other pirate um, pirate curses beyond, like, the curse of, um, like, the dead and the sea. I wonder if the if the Pirate King has other accursed treasure. Or at least the Pirate King could have left a representation of the Black Spot to show that, um, to show that this was a, dis uh, like, a former member of the pirate crew. If the former pirate government official patron ends up dead, they could show up later as a ghost pirate. That's they totally true. could. In fact, they could show up as a ghost pirate some point near, near, like in the plot who helps the PCs. Yes. Like as a ghost pirate who helps fight the other ghost pirates or the pirate king or something at a crucial moment. Um, especially if the PCs were having trouble with something. And it's like the, the, the veil between the living and the dead has become thin. The, and the pirates of, of this crew have been called back. But I, for one, will not uh, will not uh, obey you or something like that. And that and that could also give the PCs a hint that they have to do with incorporals in advance, so that they can maybe pick up their stock. Especially if you have a group that wouldn't naturally, with their abilities or equipment, be good at dealing with incorporeals. That tells them, hey, get your anti-incorporeal stuff in order, because you're going to be dealing with some ghost pirates. And that also makes them think, oh gosh. Cruise worth of ghost pirates. This isn't going to be easy. Ghost pirates. It just keeps escalating and, and escalating. zombie and skeleton pirates for the bone ship. Yes. Every time they Much pick earlier more. on, they were talking about um, someone was mentioning that, uh, I think Craig, that the hook's activation was like slowly causing like zombie pirates to like queue up near the docks and they were ready to, to man the bone ship. Uh, maybe, oh yeah, the ghost, maybe the ghost um, attaches to one of the PC's magic items, and then that means that they can pop up whenever the GM needs to intervene. The former pirate government official needs a name, be or, because typing former pirate government official is too much. Alright guys, name the former pirate government official. Or give a short official uh, title for what the new position is. Yes. Like Vizier, if we want to do that, so that we don't have to type the long thing. Pirate Mark. Pirate Mark. 
It's always good to have someone friendly be hanging around the most intense dungeon like the PCs need to rest. Alright, we'll call the former pirate government official Pirate Mark. Pirate Mark. Our mates, I mean Pirate Mark. So you wouldn't call so they wouldn't call themselves Gemini Pirate Ute. Mark while they're like not obviously be, being a government official who's a secret undercover pirate. But titles like that that are catchy and easy to remember are super useful in the outlining process to keep characters straight and you don't have to worry about Coming up with um, the full names as long as you can keep them straight. Viceroy Mark, Commodore Yar, or the Portmaster, Igor, totally trustworthy Mark. <laughs> uh, he works in the Ministry of Magic and has, has the, the title, title Arcane, Arcane Mark. Mark. <laughs> TTM for short, for total trustworthy Mark. Not suspicious at all. <laughs> yep. I could see this character being the portmaster, the commodore, the viceroy, mm -hmm. if we're going with some of the more um, reasonable <laughs> <laughs> suggestions. Goodman Bly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we can use any of these names. Yep. Yar. Uh, Commodore Yard. Portmaster. <laughs> <laughs> so we can use any of these names if we want for um, former pirate government official. But uh, I think we, we actually have a pretty good plot that has jolled yeah. here with multiple hooks to go in, potentially. A lot of the, hooks. Including the off-the-hook hook. And there's a lot of sort of sandboxy investigation with multiple ways. So it, it starts off... We pick, actually, we have multiple hooks, but we pick one of them and it's narrow. Then it widens out because we have a lot of things that the Pirate King can do sort of in the middle. But it all is eventually going to lead to the PCs getting too close. And once the bone ship comes out, it narrows down again and the PCs chase after. There might be a little bit of sandboxiness with, like, where the PCs go if we do a ocean exploration and on the island. But narrows again in the base on the island with the final confrontation. So... It actually goes narrow, wide, narrow, wide, narrow. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So Craig says the viceroy could actually be missing a hand. So that's actually yeah, that actually could make the viceroy suspicious. Hmm. Perhaps you. Uh, perhaps you took perhaps. the hook because you are looking for be, because you have a hook hand. But well, you probably it's like perhaps you took the hook because you're missing a hand, and so you might want to use this magical hook for yourself. I think that to make the viceroy, who is their patron, maximally suspicious, that the viceroy does not have a hook, but has like you know a false hand that looks like a hand in a glove. Yeah. But the PCs can make a perception check to tell that it's actually an artificial hand. Uh, that, you know, it's not move or moving. The fingers are never really moving on it. Hey, Doc Wash. Hi. Welcome. Um, and so they're like, wait a minute. The vice, our own patron, the viceroy is missing a hand. Doesn't viceroy want anyone to know motive, about it. But he doesn't want anyone to know about. <laughs> yes. Hey, hey. David. So, uh, Craig says artificial hand is a great idea. Yeah, I think that it makes sense. If it was a hook or just an obviously missing hand, yeah. it would be too But, like, if it's, say, if it's say, like, a wooden hand or something yeah. like that. Yeah, which they keep in a glove, so you just can't always necessarily tell. And the vice where can give them a list of places and people to investigate. Yeah, it's a starting point, which is good because sometimes PCs at the beginning of a sandbox investigation are like, well, what do we do first? And if you give them a few places to investigate... One of, even if you don't um, hammer them with rule of three, which is the rule that we talked about in investigations where you give the same information three times to make sure they find it. If you're in a, in a railroad investigation where they got to go to one particular place, you've got to hammer them with rule of three. In a sandbox investigation like this one, you don't. Just give them a bunch of places, and if one of them eventually will catch their interest, then they'll go that route, and it's okay because we have generated so much stuff that any of the routes that they take will take will eventually lead them to one of the ideas that we had. And one of the cool things about sandboxy investigations like this with multiple routes is that the P 
PCs might decide to back off of one route and check out the other route to see if it gives them more information. And then seeing that convergence of information can make the PCs not only feel really good about how well they've explored things, but also recognize that, oh, this is too much to be a coincidence. One of these could have been a coincidence, but once you put two and three together... And Possible Cabbage has a great idea, which is one of the places on the Viceroy's list turns out to be a real bad situation for the PCs once they go there. So, which, op, um, like, I mean, almost obviously if the Viceroy has gathered these people, there's really no reason, even if he did steal the hook, to just send, gather people and then send them to a bad situation, but Possible Cabbage knows correctly that PCs just get mad whenever it's a bad situation and suspicious, Yeah. even if it wouldn't make sense. And so that is an excellent way to throw some shade. It's like, they just let us into this really awful fight mm -hmm. that was supposed to be a place to investigate. Yeah, because the, the Viceroy wouldn't know every all the details of the case, because otherwise they wouldn't need the PCs to investigate. Right. So then there's a situation that the Viceroy expect isn't too bad, but maybe the reason that the place is, is really bad or dangerous has something to do with the movements of the Pirate King herself. So there may possibly be clues... Even if they're not too obvious, the things that people may be able to pick up in hindsight. Uh, oh, and you could have, uh, Shrey was talking about a town gossip that could give both good information and bad information. So the, are... the bartender, former pirate, yeah. could serve in a similar role to that, or maybe there's a, um, a drunk who is the town gossip who is in that bar who gives mm -hmm. both good and bad information, and eventually, when it becomes clear that something's going on, the bartender herself comes out and is like, listen... Don't listen to anything that drunk is telling you. I know some real things. Well, you know, I think, and this has certainly been the case of War for the Crown, sometimes it's funny to have those implausible leads and then to pick them up and follow them. And a lot of times you know they're not going to give you actual information about the investigation, but they can give you more information about the world. And then the occasional times when they actually give you something useful for the investigation, it's hilarious. Mm-hmm. We had a, a situation in War for the Crown where there was an NPC who really wanted us to investigate uh, one lead, but we kept doing even the most random things first. So they're like, come on! Why are you going and talking to this person in our house who is a, a conspiracy, crazy conspiracy theorist, theorist. theorist? Instead of actually going to investigate the main thing that I think you should be investigating here. <laughs> we're like, we need to follow all the leads. <laughs> Um, Craig says the bad situation could be a press gang actually looking for, quote, bodies to join the Pirate King's new crew. <laughs> uh, uh, Steven from Oprah Comics says, does Mark always ask every lead, is this something you need to tell us which will be key to the plot? No. No, I only ask Venture Captains that because a lot of the early Pathfinder Society scenarios would just leave out critical information. Like, uh, there would be times where it was like, if you ask, will there be any dragons around? They'll be like, oh yeah, there's a black dragon there. Prepare for acid damage. But if you don't, they'll just send you off. So, now, um, because, um, Steven in particular, because of the fact that this character that I sent, it, um, put in role for combat, is a conversion of my first edition character. I sort of assumed she has some of that experience, and she's my first first edition character, so she played the early scenarios. So, she, um... Her personality is, uh, she's not, like, sarcastic. She just has experience with Venture Captains who just won't tell us. Mm -hmm. Especially after they ask the cryptic question that you asked, which is like, oh, so that's it? You don't have any more questions? You're just ready to head off? That mm -hmm. if a Venture Captain ever says that in an early season scenario or something like that, it means they have some other secret information that they refuse to tell you unless you guess their question or ask a question that gives it as an answer. So, um... Mm -hmm. She was, uh, she was triggered by that um, a little bit and uh, <laughs> therefore asked, is there any useful information that you're not going to tell us unless we ask for it? <laughs> um, uh, Fortune Pumpkin says the shady merchants, that they could be actively working against the PCs. That's, that's true. Like, they could be also following the PCs or even infiltrating the PCs. You could um, have, like, a supposedly friendly NPC who works for the merchants and the thieves guild or even if you do the hook where everyone's getting off the hook you could bring one pc aside make sure this is right for your group and be like you work for the merchants guild and their thieves guild and you're infiltrating this group that the uh, uh the viceroy or whatever we decided the position was for that guy is um 
is gathering together. I want to go back to Stephen's question, how to best handle info you give to the PCs. So um, one of the structures that I've used, other than just putting the information all in the read aloud text, is having questions for the PCs to ask as a part of a natural conversation, and then putting a note at the bottom. Even if the PCs don't ask about X, Y, and Z, the venture captain tells them about X, Y, and Z before they leave. So the ones that are really critical, the venture captain will always tell them, but that breaks up the sort of wall of text a bit. Possible Cabbage has an idea that will make Jason Bowman happy because he likes to do the exact same thing. It says, in an urban investigation, uh, Possible Cabbage likes to have an encounter with an audio which can be resolved just by talking to it. That is definitely something that Jason likes. Um, I, I remember in my, um, in my first three years of working at Paisa, maybe my first two years, Jason told me in confidence that that Odiog actually can speak common like six or seven times. Mm -hmm. It's like, did you know that at Odiog they can actually speak common? And I already knew because there were several adventures with them where they spoke common. Like hats. Yep. Well, uh, even before hats, there were there were several. Dogs. Oh no, I know, but hats is the one. Veterans I think of vault. Most. You can sort of talk to those Odiogs and give them food. There's there's a good number of them. But yes, hats. Also, there is the mighty king. Golrish of the sewers of Zibar. Um, let's see what we've got here, too. Bowing down to Golrish in the sewers was not pleasant for the PCs. Everyone loves Golrish. There could be an atmosphere of the townsfolk being an oppressed colony with an occupying force of corrupt navy and marines around. That's the press gang and overbearing government officials looking to blame the PCs. That could be possible, too. Like, in the end... If, if you have a really oppressive government, in the, in the end, the real twist could be, like, uh, so the pirate king does that fake out, just a deception, makes it seem like it was the angry princess throws the hook off. And then the princess, who is uncontrolled, maybe just hates the oppressive government and actually was dominated, but, but thinks... That she's going to cover for the Pirate King. And be like, yeah, it was me. Mm -hmm. You could do that, too. It's like, I hate this government. Uh, or, or like the Pirate King is, oh, I'm going to take control and whatever. And then the princess is like, uh, you know, I really hate the government, too. And then they're like, let's, well, let's work, work together. together. <laughs> let's work together. You're a, um, you're a great fighter. I'm a, I'm a mage. Mm -hmm. I think we can share this, yep. bo share this body. We can do some things. Um, you could potentially have that. I think what this just goes to show is there's a lot of ways that you can develop on this based on... Um, Unfortunate Pumpkin says there's a big choice at the beginning with all the ways we have. Who are you going to work for? The government? The merchants? Maybe the crew of the Pirate King's so son slash successor? And if you're writing this for your own home group and you know what they like, you can tailor a lot of these decisions based on what you think they'll be most interested in. It could even be that you know that some PCs are going to be most interested in working for one group and some PCs are most interested in working for another group and you have these interesting dynamics where the, where the you know, some PCs you know are going to be suspicious of one group over another. Like, no, we should work with them. They're totally trustworthy. No, they're not trustworthy. You can never trust merchants. I remember when I was blah, 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 These blah, merchants blah. are part of the local thieves guild. They're terrible. What's wrong with thieves? <laughs> they cetera, take in children on the streets and train them to be career criminals. Um, uh, so there's more talk about Adiugs, the horrible, gross, horrible monsters who can be completely reasonable. Steven says he had an adventure where an Adiug ran an underground casino. Well, our Warlord, it's not a bad habit if you make items whenever you tune into our episodes. I'm just glad that we can inspire you. Yeah, if this episode inspires you to make new things each time, that's great. I kind of think homebrewing, making house rules and news new elements for the game is one of my favorite things like that's why i became a game designer and making a game that makes it easier for you guys to do that is was really important to me for pathfinder second edition the grimacing emoji pasted in pf2 homebrew let's see the grimacing emoji hook of, oh, the, pirate hook of the pirate king unique artifact cursed evocation occult necromancy transmutation uh, the, this hook, once worn on the left arm of the notorious Pirate King, still contains a fragment of her spirit. It functions as a plus three, high-grade silver, anarchic, ghost-touch, major striking dagger that has the freehand trait. The ability to imprint the Pirate King's psyche on victims who wear it is both unnerving and insidious. 
Worn by creatures not the true owner, its true owner is dead. It can cast a ninth level possession on the wielder. If the target fails, they are affected by the spell for as long as they hold the hook. This possession takes the form of the Pirate King's ancient and long dead will being exerted over the host. Activate. You are requirements. You are holding the hook of the Pirate King. You're either its true owner or possessed by its true owner's spirit. In fact, you summon the ancient turtle boat ship of the Pirate King. It emerges from a body of water capable of holding it, to which you are adjacent. It's helpful towards you, allowing you inside its maw. <laughs> Oh man, I was just working on artifacts yesterday, so I was like, oh, it's another artifact. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Speaking of casinos, this yeah, this adventure could totally have a casino in it. One of the places the PCs can go to during their open-ended sandbox investigation. Well, or you, that could also you be actually didn't ask did. me to read it. I just decided to read it out loud. <laughs> So, you know, Stray says that they've had a PC go off and get hired by different patrons to investigate the same thing. If handled carefully, it can be a lot of fun. You have to be careful not to overly pit the PCs against one another. That's definitely true. I've definitely had one-shots where every character was, um, every character was hired by one patron who was, like, very upstanding, um, to do a very upstanding thing, except for every single one was secretly hired by another patron to infiltrate the investigation. <laughs> That they thought was everyone else was just regular investigators. Yep. So it's like you're the only one who was secretly hired by some person to infiltrate this invest investigation. If you know which adventure he's talking about, don't say it because yeah. it's possible we'll run it again and it's spoilers. So. Yep. But um, it was just funny. Um, but certainly, even you could have the PC just know that the whole group is actually secretly hired by multiple people just because they want to get extra money, like. One of, um, I feel like one, like Linda's very first adventure she ran before, that was just for me, um, I feel like we managed to get hired for the exact same job by two or three people. Yeah, you did. And we weren't working at cross purposes, they just all wanted us to do the exact same thing, so we just got more money. Uh, well, you also, <laughs> you were also followed by an illusory retinue of people. So Who they had to pay. Them, you called yourselves the eight noble views, but you actually only had three party members, so by making the more illusions, you got more money. That's correct. That's true. Yep. Also, we cleaned up nine people because Nomric um, was, oh, yeah, Nomric Nomric was the ninth. That's right. We haven't was, played that in forever. Was, was not one of the eight noble views. Yeah. So, therefore, the, they had to pay for like a group of nine adventurers. However... It's fair to say that Alisaria was such a workaholic that she did the work of the seven characters that she was supposed to be. Fair enough. <laughs> like, they did solve the mystery that had been, like, weeks of problems and, like, months the last time that that serial killer was on the loose of not being caught, like, in, like, one or two days of hard investigation. So, I think they deserve being paid triple. I think mean, that's so convoluted. <laughs> So convoluted. Starting with the initial adventure and just adding more and more things because I knew you would solve the initial adventure too quickly. Yeah, there were a lot of things that you added in, like all those gangs that were not in the adventure. Yeah. All right. Um. Let's see. Speaking of casinos, this adventure should definitely have one. I love adding casinos to adventures, says uh, Stephen. So yeah, let's add in. Um, let's add in a casino here. Is that where the bartender works? Um. Maybe, or, 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 or actually, maybe what actually happens is that there is a casino slash auction house mm -hmm. where there's a scene where um, in order to get, so the Pirate King has the princess and is able to seize some capital, but obviously if the princess t withdraws a lot of money from the royal treasury, it's going to be really suspicious, but could mm -hmm. like pawn some jewelry, but also... At one point, puts the hook up for auction, but it's an, actually a counterfeit. Um, in order to flush out to see who's actually looking for it, and also oh, and unfortunate pumpkin says the pirate king's successor could be encountered in the casino, so the PCs yes. find the pirate king's successor and it could in be, this fake it, auction. It could be the home base of the merchants in the thieves guild. Yeah, perhaps yes, but so the pirate king could put up a fake version of the hook up for auction. Just to, to flush out who all is looking for it and knows that the Thieves Guild are at the casino and auction house and are likely to try to steal it and it's fake anyway. And also just the hope is the bare minimum they get uh, that she gets no money from it but has now seen who seen the faces and knows who 
everyone is who um, she needs to look out for. And if she's lucky, uh, there might not be an altercation with the PCs and other groups, and someone will actually buy it and pay yes. before figuring out it's a counterfeit. Or like the thief, if the thief guild steal it, she doesn't get the money, but she might also get a lot of money. Yeah. And um, also ultimately, if she, she she considers the thieves guild to be a problem. There's a chance that, like, if the government finds out about this auction, they'll just bust down the doors and sort of break, some, break up the casino and auction house and find illegal activity mm -hmm. and could throw two of her enemies against each other. Uh, Craig says the bartender secretly runs the auction portion and tries to keep info from the PCs till they find the auction itself. <laughs> that could be fun. So, if, so with all these twists and turns, if you were actually to include this many twists and turns in the adventure, I would highly recommend as a GM having thorough notes about each NPC, their motivations, their goals, what they have told the PCs, and what is true, and like what these plots are, because this is going to get very confusing, and um, you also will want to be able to give it as a recap for your players. Too. And some of these plots in this adventure, as it seems to be congealing, won't happen. Yes. So you'll have them as events, and mm -hmm. but the PCs might do something that just like, oh wow, the PCs actually just revealed all the factions that were in play. There's no reason. There's not as much reason for this auction or something else like that. Or they burned down the casino before the auction for some reason. So you yeah. might uh, you might have only some of these events happen, and in your own home game, unlike in an AP volume where you have to print everything, you can just easily pull out that section and. Just not running. And you, and when you're constructing this in a home game too, you might know. Okay, the PCs are going to have a confrontation with a group of government officials, probably. But you don't know where that's going to happen in the adventure yet. But you can still prepare group of government officials encounter, and then you have that ready for wherever it pops in. As opposed to having to prepare different group of government officials encounters for each of the locations where they might show up. Possible cabbage suggests an action scene during an auction where you have to make a roll to make sure your action is not interpreted as a bid. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like Steven for all for combat did a fall of plague stone spreadsheet with um, all the things that you were talking about there Linda figuring out what could go on and with the number of NPCs this is going to uh, what were we talking about this in mystery and investigations perhaps um, you're, you'll want to have other resources to assist the PCs with tracking such as art to represent the NPCs um, Handouts that have some of the basic information and sort of guide them through filling things out. And you also want to, in this case, probably ask players to be giving a recap when they come back to a new session what happened last time so you can understand both what they think is going on and you can also fill in details that you know they figured out because they were talking about them during the session but that they missed in their recap. That makes sense. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of people are running Plague Stone that are going to go check out Steven's notes that are on here. Uh, Craig mentions that if you're running a persistent homebrew world, you pretty much have to keep a lot of notes, and that's definitely true. That's, that's absolutely important, um, just because the GM might forget some of the names of these characters, and if it's persistent, you need to make sure everyone and knows. And if you're not sure if it was, if it was Vice Roy Yar, or um, the Portmaster, or Pirate Mark... Or Commodore. Commodore, or any of those other things that suggested above that you eventually decided to name that one NPC, then especially in an investigation, um, it's important to keep your details straight because it can really confuse the PCs and lead them down rabbit holes. That's definitely true. They're like, wait a minute, what if Viceroy Yar and Commodore are working against each other? Yeah. Um, to, uh, 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 but the Viceroy is, is working together with the, um, the Portmaster. Because they seem to have the same goals and be very similar to each other. And, and so all, all, all three of those are the same, the same, NPC, yeah. the same person. Uh, random PF2 story from Samurai JWL. Walked by someone wearing a, uh, a joke t-shirt, made a joke, started talking about hobbies, mentioned RPGs, and he said, have you heard about Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Ten minutes later, his wife called, wondering where he was. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> That's cool. Yeah, unfortunate pumpkin. If you want to run this adventure for your players, then please do and let us know how it turns yeah, out. Let us know which path they took if you if you run it because uh, it seems like a very interesting adventure, especially for groups that like mysteries and pirates and um, twists and turns. So, 
Ooh, and Ular Warlord has um, offered to help set up for our project pumpkin, so that'd be cool. Uh, we actually have a um, a sub ch channel in the um, the RK Mark Discord server called LFG, where people can sort of set up if they're looking for groups together. Um, that might not be. I wonder if that would be the place where PF2 homebrew. There's a few places where you could plot together to. Um, Try to turn this into an adventure that you're actually going to run. That would be fun. Uh, David says, can eventually characters start to consider the Conan option. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse to set up a giant zombie turtle bone ship. Well, the best part is, I feel like that there's, in the plot, if I remember, there's actually two really awesome ships. There's the magic bone ship that she first pulls up out of the harbor to escape. So you get a bone ship, and then you get the zombie turtle that's a fortress. It's yeah. island size and has uh, a whole island on it with a bunch of stuff that you eventually s search the surface, don't find the base, and realize that it's, you have to carve into the turtle, and inside of it, it's been hollowed out, and the base is in there. So yeah. there's not one, but two really awesome um, mm -hmm. bone ships slash uh, zombie ships. Yeah, and when, you, when, when David says, have to be careful, eventually the characters start to consider the code and option of just killing things. Um, when you're doing an investigation for your group, uh, having an idea of how thorough of an investigation they want, how many twists and turns is fun for them before they just are like, okay, no, this is getting ridiculous. We don't want to keep following this anymore. So the number of twists and turns that we ended up with this in the end is definitely on the high side. But so, you have to make sure the characters are true to themselves. Like, for instance, as we were talking about it here, we pointed out that it would be interesting if if they are working for the Viceroy and the Viceroy gave them some leads and one of them led them into a bad situation, mm -hmm. the PCs might think that's suspicious. But from, from our perspective uh, of thinking of being true to the character, there's no reason for the Viceroy to hire the PCs and then send them into an ambush. They should have just not hired the PCs. Yeah. So every character needs to be logically doing something that makes sense from their perspective and motivations. Um, if you do that, you can put in a lot of twists and turns, and you can at least usually have uh, the PCs at the end nodding and, and, and think it makes sense. Whereas if you ever lose sight of that and just want to do a twist that sort of um, doesn't really fit with what you've done in the character in the past, that can lead to the players just being like, well, who can know mm -hmm. what's going well, on? Well, the, the biggest twist type of twist to be careful about is the bait and switch, where the PCs think that they're about to succeed at something, they think that they figured it out, and then yoink. So if you have something where the PCs think they've got it and then, oh, that's taken away from them, they don't get the treasure, they don't get the information, whatever, um, first of all, that's something you can totally use it, but to use fairly and to make sure that w they still do get something out of it. So they don't get what they were initially planning on, but they have a lead for where to go next and they get something useful from it. Right. The end night Shyamalan effect. Yes. <laughs> all the twists. It was what, actually... What a twist! Fortune Pumpkin says, what's the big piece of evidence that eventually leads them to the princess? Uh, so, I think that we don't, uh, we either need a piece of evidence that leads them to the princess, or a piece of, or a piece of evidence that leads them to, the that leads them to the pirate, realize that the pirate, ki what the pirate king is doing, aka lead them to the princess's second double life, and all the activities that the princess has been doing as the pirate king after being possessed one or the other so there's a few options if you want to t put them back towards the princess then um you could say that the pcs when they're dealing with these thieves or somewhere they start finding some jewelry that they recognize as royal so like even though she was being careful it's like oh wait this is the princess's jewelry that was they think it was stolen, and when they investigate it, they eventually find out that something else is going on. And maybe they, maybe so there's signs that maybe the evidence. princess is, maybe the, the official thing is that the palace realizes that the princess has gone missing. So they, but they don't want to be too obvious about that because they don't want to create some sort of panic or whatever or make it seem like their guards are incompetent. So there's also this investigation to into the whereabouts of the princess that's going on, and that could even be something that the PCs are are being suspected of. And she might seem to be kidnapped, so then mm -hmm. already she the fact there's a missing princess was in the wind. There could be that. She could be going back to the castle and doing things but being missing and living a double life, in which case you might not even realize 
who you're going after is the princess. You're actually just hunting down all the activities that the hook person is doing, not knowing it's Princess Slash Pirate King, but just all of those are leaving tons of evidence. That's probably more likely than that you figure out it was the princess before, and it leads to a like a more shocking reveal when, mm -hmm. um, especially if the PCs worked for the nobles or at least somehow have like met the princess in if she is going back to the castle, have met the princess at some other point during the adventure when they were not trying to investigate her, but she was just there and they were doing something else, and um, then later on, so that they would know what she looks like for sure. And have talked to her. And that makes me wonder, too, if the PCs follow the trail back to the palace and are like, oh, yeah, the, we really think that something suspicious is going on in the palace. And they make a big deal about it. And the princess is like, well, I can't get caught. And then the princess decides to use that to push the government to go against the PCs. Mm -hmm. and, and pin things on them. Hi, Alex. Hi, Alex. So, yeah, I would say that you have a lot of opportunity because of the fact that while the princess side may have left only a small amount of evidence and that may be it may be unreasonable for that to be what the pcs find but maybe it won't mm -hmm. um the the dark side um of the of the pirate captain is leaving a huge trail even though she's being careful to uh the pirate king is being careful to cover the trail and throw shade on other people it's eventually going to come to roost back at, uh, back at the pirate captain. Indeed. All sorts of things, like rising up the ghosts, there might be a way to, like, follow the trail of spiritual essence back to figure out, oh, wow, that was done in this site. And then, so, tr you could trace, trace back any action that the pirate king did and eventually be able to run across the pirate king, who's probably, like, wearing some kind of costume so that you might not be able to tell that it's the princess immediately, but the PCs have met the princess, and one of them maybe makes a perception check, like, this is actually the princess. And at that mm -hmm. point, the pirate king can't go back to double life vigilante of pretending to be the princess and bone ship time. Yep. Any time is bone ship time. Especially if the hook summons the bone ship. Uh, yes. Go to the harbor, summon the bone ship... To be manned by the crew of the dead. Yes. And then you go to the Turtle Island, and we've got all that figured out. Um, but maybe not if there's some sea adventures along the way and sea monsters, which seem like they would make sense for this story. Since once you're on the Turtle Island, you're sort of, again, on land, even though it's not that big of a land. Yeah. So having some sea stuff would definitely make sense. Well, maybe the, we were talking about the sea caves, so maybe the only entrance to the, to the under... To those types of places in the belly of the turtle is through underwater and then there's the sea guardians ah so like there's the only hole is actually under the turtle yes not over the turtle not over the so turtle. you investigate the top of the island though that may if it's obvious in the top in the under turtle and it's just not in the top that may seem like a bait and switch because our uh we, so we'll have to be careful about that mm -hmm. but yeah our goal was you search the top of the island and you don't find the base there, but you eventually realize there's a way into the turtle, but maybe that's because you find like an old map that talks about going under the turtle. Yes. Um, so there has to be something that something that indicates to you to go under the turtle. Or or it could very well be that under the turtle that there's two ways to go in. There's from above the the top of the turtle or the bottom of the turtle. And the top of the turtle has you fighting more undead. But the bottom of the turtle has you fighting aquatic creatures with possibly getting the drop on the undead because you're going through a back entrance that they didn't recognize you knew about. Or maybe the sea caves is, like, another island where the first mace stashed their uh, map of mm -hmm. the two maps that could find the moving, um, the moving turtle island. So that it's like, oh, yes, let me tell you where to go. And it's just another slight, small site that you head off to to get the map. Um, and so it could be its own sort of sea cave thing that is yeah. an actual cave and not part of a turtle, um, potentially, and has more sea monsters in it. Sounds good. I think we've got a pretty solid adventure I here. I think we've got this. Um, and it'll be really, um, uh, really interesting if Unfortunate Pumpkin actually runs this adventure. I know every time I've been in one of these panels, somebody has said that they, um, uh, that they wanted to run the adventure, and they maybe did, but this time... It's on, um, it's on a Twitch channel with a Discord server, so we can find out if that happens. It'll mm -hmm. be fun. We can find out what elements of this discussion people want to take and what yeah. things they want to 
No, that was broad, and yeah. there were a lot of options to pick. Um, off of these hooks. Whoever wants to write it up can write it up. Multiple people Multiple can write people it up. Write it'll it. look different for each person, I think, at this point. So, absolutely. Um, all right. So, I think we've done pretty well here, everyone. Shall we say goodbye to YouTube and then do a few more Twitch things for the end? Sounds good to me. All right. Bye, YouTube. See you next time. Bye. All right.